you talked about how we use time or don't use time. So I think A pluses help me out. I think right now we're working with almost 80 schools through our coaching. And I was in a coaching meeting yesterday with our staff. And uh, one of the coaches said, well, I'm going to have a lot of time next week. And I said, why are you going to have a lot of time? School's in session. Well, they don't really want us in the classrooms next week, right before Thanksgiving. Why right? not? Right? Mm. So you, you pointed that out. Yeah. Yeah, that's another. That happens a lot. We have to have back all that time that we, we take out for <coughs> other things. Yeah. And if Halloween can be attributed to a great learning, and if there are other things going on, fine. But I don't think it's part of the curriculum. Yeah. So I asked this question to you last night. <coughs> this this seems pretty pretty clear to me. But in your travels around the world, there are a lot of countries and a lot of school districts and a lot of schools that are not doing this. Why do you think that is? Leadership. <laughs> it's really say, say more about that. Say more about that. Um, teachers can have a look at this, and they might want to have a go. <laughs> but if they're not getting support from their leaders, or their leaders are not driving the change, this is not going to happen. Leadership, without doubt, is something that we just aren't quite getting right. Because so much time of our leaders in our schools is spent on administration and management, and it's not on being the core business of learning and being the lead learner in schools. So we want to make sure that leaders have clear understanding of what's going on in schools. We want them to collect their evidence about what's happening and they, they have to understand it. Because I think we do lose sight of it and we're put in those positions of doing compliance. One of the things that I talked to your people about the other day is sometimes you have to actually treat the compliance with what it deserves. And that is, thank you, tick, 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 move on to the real business. Get it over and done with. And then, I also have a great fear in this country that you are overwhelmed and that our teachers here and our leaders are so constrained by what they can do that they actually fear about what some of the things they aren't doing and can't do in their classrooms. And they're settling for what they, what they know. And it's not based on research. We know this stuff. And if you're not doing it, and it's not happening in your schools, you're actually getting into a malpractice situation. We want to treat it like doctors. If we are treating our patients as we did 40 years ago, then that's wrong. If you're teaching as you did 40 years ago, or as was going on, that's wrong, because we know more. If Abraham Lincoln came into this school, into this environment now, he would not recognize anything, anything. Transport, communication systems, Nothing. But if he walked into a school classroom, he would know exactly what was happening in that place. He died in 1864. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. I, knew, I learned American history. Yeah. 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 That's impressive. <laughs> okay, uh, we've got two microphones. So I'm sure everyone has a question in mind. So we're going to try to get through as many as we can. We have one right in the center section right in the middle of the row. And our microphone uh, uh, holders are CAT1 and CAT2. <laughs> um, my question, um, I actually work with an after school program and our challenge is homework. The parents want us to uh, make sure their children's homework is complete. We only have about an hour to do homework. Our homework hour is from four to five. I'm new to the program, the after school program, and I've wanted to eliminate the homework, period. Uh, because the kids are in school all day, you know, they have all this energy and excitement, and I really want to go into some of our enrichment activities and outdoor play and art, and there's so many other things, but I'm, I'm sort of stuck, but I like what you said, and I want to show that to our funders who also 
require that we have the homework lab. Yeah, thank you. And she also wants to keep her job. Yeah, right. and, that's, <laughs> and, that's the thing. and that's why I'm talking about you're you're in that position of being the teacher. It actually needs a leadership to make that decision. And yeah. so supporting the leaders and having that clarity of understanding about what the research <laughs> says is the important part for you. But I cannot but endorse what you're saying, and in particular about play. Uh, that's becoming more and more, it's been taken out of uh, so many curriculum for the, uh, even the under fives, and so that all has to be around learning all the time. Play is learning, and the more we take play and those experiences, uh, <laughs> we have to get those written in. But I'm going to go a step further than that. We've also got to build in kids falling over, making mistakes, um, hurting themselves, because we are building a society around the world of children and who won't take risks, and that's going to be to the detriment of all of our countries in the long term. Because, and that comes back to play and having those opportunities to experience outside. I would rather have my children make really bad decisions when they're seven and have a consequence like a broken arm or whatever. It's not consequential in the long run and go behind a car when they're 17 or something else because they haven't learned about consequences for actions. So, yeah, stick with your program and go for it. Other questions? Right here in the back. And then, Kat, we've got one here in the front. Yes, sir. So I'm curious, you had mentioned earlier about some of those very high effect sizes that there were some more obscure practices. I'm curious about what those may have been. Oh, goodness. And then maybe some of the ones that were on the, the lower end that we should try to avoid that you may not have talked about. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm going to ask you to buy the book <laughs> because they're all sitting inside there. Those new ones that are coming out, um, I, I'm going, I haven't got them in my head and I do apologize for that. They're in John's latest piece of work and he actually hasn't even published that. Uh, you're the third audience that's seen that slide with the 1.97 sitting on it. Um, so I, I'm not even at liberty to tell you what they are, even if I did remember some of them. What I can tell you though, is sitting in that lower end practices, um, what else have we got sitting down in there? Oh goodness, you've really put me on the spot. No, I'm sorry, it's just not coming into my head. Can I come back to you? Can you meet up with me at morning tea? <laughs> Alan? I love the, um, all of the statistical analysis of the very influence, various influencers on learning, but I'm sure it may be a little more complicated than it appears on the slides. How do you separate statistically the influence of something like parental involvement from student expectations when they may be related? Uh, very much related, that's right. Um, what we've tried to do is um, take out the isolators from each of those studies and then put, the, uh, there's a factor analysis that goes in around that as well. So they've all uh, been reasonably well retested, all of the studies when they come into to the laboratory with John uh, and his group of PhD students who are operating on this. Um, one of the things that we were always really cautious about saying is that you can't just say that if you've got parental involvement and you've got this and you've got that, you will get a 1.2 or something like that. They're not growing on each other. They're isolated and they need to all work together. But that one about the student expectations, one of the things that we do know is that there is great variance from homes in what they expect their students to be able to do. And uh, one of the things that we can change that is going back to what the teacher expectations of the students are. So if we know, and a higher socioeconomic, here's something I'm just remembering a couple of things for you, sir. Higher socioeconomic homes have around about a uh, 0.52 impact greater than children from lower homes. So we know automatically that children from higher socioeconomic homes are going to do better, and part of that will be parental expectation and the provisions that they can put there. So knowing that, what are we going to do about that for our other students? And that's our point about the teacher expectations. So from a statistical basis, we always keep coming back as they're isolated units, um, but what we want to have people operating is amongst a number of them, so not just taking out one or two. So don't just go for our student expectations, look at all the ones that sit in behind that as well. <coughs> so you were making some points earlier, and I've just remembered two, gender and diet. It doesn't matter whether your kids go to a co-ed school, a boys school, a girls school, it's irrelevant. Kids will do pretty much the same. We have more variability within a school than what we do between schools. 
the biggest thing is what's the teacher like in the school that your children are at, not what school they're at. That's one. The other one is uh, diet. Diet, as it turns out, doesn't really make a difference to student outcomes. We know there are better diets that are better for our health and they're better for our longer life, but they don't actually, at this point in the research, show that they're going to improve student outcomes. I think it's diet sitting on 1.0.12. Uh, uh, so we know there are students from all types of schools who have fantastic outcomes regardless of diet. So you mean to tell me when I told my kids to eat a good breakfast before um, their tests, yeah. it didn't make any difference? Yeah. Not a bit. Um, I told my son to do that as well, and I used to go. Yeah, I, I didn't have this research. Yeah, I had it, and I still told huh? my son. You still, you still told him? He used to eat tins of tuna. Have a question back. The statistical packaging is actually uh, in chapter two of the first book, so go in there and have a good look at that. That's, it's, it's a huge piece of work that comes into play before we put any of these out. We're going to go here, and then we're going to go in the center section. Have you related your expectations toward innate child ability? Sorry, would you repeat the Have you related expectation toward the innate child ability? In other words, within that child, there some predetermined, so to speak. I know we can have influence, but there, I'm lousy in math. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that. And you know, I've worked and worked, and I've had tutors, and, and it's just not my cup of tea. So I'm just wondering, within your studies, have you looked at? Are considered the child's innate ability, so to speak. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Um, and yes, the answer is yes. So we don't uh, do research. It doesn't talk about all children being at this level. We're talking about setting the expectation for each child that is appropriate for them. But it's interesting that you're talking about that because there was a wonderful piece of research that's been done recently by a woman called Sue Smith uh, in mathematics. And she's looking at trajectory of student achievement. And if you go along a normal trajectory over time, the students are going up like that. But she wanted to put an interference in. So at, at the junction down here, at around about time two out of a time six, she put in mentors for all the students, or not all the students, sorry, for her, her clinical group that she was doing the trial on. And what happened was, is that all the regular students progressed at the normal way. But the ones who had the mentor, their progression rate went up astronomically. And their mentors weren't all math teachers, they were people who were able to uh, support them in all aspects of their learning, but their math changed. So it's always interesting about the expectations because it's coming back to that question that we set earlier, uh, how do you know what, uh, and pushing, as John said, pushing kids beyond what they think they can do to another place. Our job is to mess with what kids think that they can do. And Sue's research showed in math that by putting that mentor in, just having that extra support around it, changed that trajectory uh, immensely. But we're not, uh, repeating the question, we're not trying to say every child will meet the same level. They won't. They all have different abilities. Uh, we also, and I must admit I stalk him, Ken Robinson. Are you familiar with the work of Sir Ken Robinson? Yes. Yeah, I, he's, yeah, I stalk him, what can I say? Um, <laughs> but his work around moving our children away just from the canon of academic subjects and having them experience other things like create anything in the creative arts area and having them explore and finding their passion, if we can do that and unlock those areas, learning will improve all around, or they'll be channeled off. But what we're wanting is kids to be successful and have that self-affirmation and efficacy that they can do it. Sir Ken was part of our, I think it was 2012 speaker oh. series. Yeah, he's oh. remarkable. He is. Question in the uh, center section. Good morning. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I'll stand up. Oh, hello. Thank you so much. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for the information. Thank you so much for the research. It's, it's ammunition that we need. Uh, we need currently and we'll need in the future, so thank you. How can we find out more about visible learning? Are there any conferences coming up? What, what can we do to, to get more into the work? I swear I did not pay her for that. She did not. <laughs> I did not. But we want more. We need more. 
Um, visible Learning is partnered with Corwin here in the United States. Corwin and they're based over in uh, Thousand Oaks just out of Los Angeles. Uh, and they are magnificent uh, partners for us. Their values sit very comfortably with, uh, with us and uh, we have a fantastic relationship with them. And we do indeed have a conference occurring here in San Antonio next July. So next July 17, 18, uh, we have got the uh, United States Systems and Policies Conference happening. So John will be there amongst other guest speakers. Um, and we'll be coming over. So that's the uh, most exciting one. The next International Visible Learning Conference is in London uh, at the end of January 2016. We've actually just had our international conference here in San Diego uh, earlier this year. So we get speakers from around the world uh, attending all of those. It's fantastic. We work a lot with Michael Fullen as well. So if you're interested in having visible learning, uh, come and talk to your school districts, your schools, whatever it might be. Go to the Corwin website and they've got their list of trainers and consultants and, the, and their sales and marketing team and there is someone here who, there who will be able to connect you with all the right people. Um, so cool. we have a common dance card, right, because Michael Fullen, oh, 20 years ago, yeah. was part of the group that launched Houston Annenberg that's now Houston A+. Well, Michael and I have just finished running some conference series together, yeah. so he and I have been sharing uh, audiences such as yourselves and running He's the remarkable. work. He's remarkable. He is. Yes. Yeah. All right, we're going to take one more question in the back. You mentioned that um, when a new strategy or intervention is applied, you should go through the cycle of evaluating, reevaluating it, and then either adapt it or drop it. Drop it. And then earlier in the presentation, you also mentioned something like professional development. Mm -hmm. really takes three to five years of implementation to see the results. Mm -hmm. So I'm I, I know a, a frustration districts and teachers and schools often have is we apply one er intervention for a year, we don't see results, so let's drop it. Yeah. So I'm wondering, is there any guidance around how long you should try certain strategies or interventions before you decide to drop them? Right, we have to be really clear about this, don't we, because I'm not talking about a literacy intervention or something like that. They are three to five years. That, that's how long it takes to see change in some of those areas, um, particularly in anything to do with the literacy areas because they're so incremental in the way that they're built. I'm talking about innovations such as, it might be something like, we're getting a lot at home in, in New Zealand about bring your own device. Right? Are you, are you having bring your own device coming in? Right. I wouldn't call it an innovation as such, but if you're not seeing any change in the way the student or the student outcomes after a year, that's not necessarily the problem with the innovation, but you have to be able to ask yourself the questions. What was the implementation like? Did we provide the teachers with enough support? Did we provide the teachers with enough pedagogical understanding to make this work? If we did, and it's still not working, why not? And we've got to keep asking those questions. And if it's not working, then you may have to drop it. However, if you've gone and asked the, the right questions, and you haven't done, because uh, so many in, uh, innovations, the problem is not the innovation, it's the implementation of it and the support that sits around that. That's the key issue. But we would want to see some change and we would see change in data. If something was working really well, we'd expect to see that in a six months to one year period uh, for students, but not for literacy. That takes longer. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Jean and Thank you. So a couple of uh, quick announcements. Um, our next speaker series will be in 2015. Uh, Tom Vanderhaar from Getting Smart uh, will be here with us. I think it's February 12th. So you can get on the website, sign up for your ticket. Um, if you sign up for your ticket, make sure you show up. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you all showed up. But we had a lot of people that signed up that didn't show up. Um, bring somebody with you uh, because these are very exciting uh, learning opportunities for all of us. So the last thing before I say uh, so long, uh, Jane Ann shared this training uh, booklet uh, with us uh, yesterday a group of coaches. And uh, so this is my 30th year in public education. I know I don't look that, that old. Um, but the title of this training uh, manual uh, is entitled uh, Creating Visible Learners. And I thought back 30 years ago 
That would not have been the title of my training manual. The title of my training manual would have been Creating Great Teachers. And this is a big shift that I think we as a country need to make. 